So when do you plan on uh, launching season two? Uh, when do we plan on launching it? That is a really great question because we're in the middle of, you know, uh, we're, we're, as it seems to be getting closer to getting out of COVID and concerns. But I mean, you listen to season one, so much of it um, depends and relies on people welcoming you into their lives, which means welcoming you into their homes. And uh, so we're not really sure when that's going to be uh, of comfort for the mass number of people whose homes we're going to go knocking on. We're going to start giving it a shot and, and see what happens. But uh, I mean, some of the best stories start to come out an hour after we've arrived and everyone starts to feel comfortable with each other and people decide, you know what, I'm going to bring up this this uh, memory that I've, I've kept in my head for 50 years, I'm going to open up to these people about it. And that, that doesn't necessarily happen when you're just standing on someone's doorstep. So for the integrity of season two to even somewhat replicate season one, um, I don't know when we're really going to be able to get started on recording episodes and therefore release it. But uh, if, if all goes well, hopefully we're, we're eyeing just next fall, um, fall 2021, Uh, a year after season one was released or if we have to push it to the to this time a year from now maybe around there i'm you know i'm curious tell me a little bit about your background i mean you you're a very good storyteller Uh, is that something that you you have training in or or experience in thank you thanks for i appreciate the compliment um yeah I, i come from news so i can't i come from a news visual background which is the opposite of podcasting um so there was certainly you know a uh a transition to make in, in kind of my knowledge of how it works and storytelling. But as a journalism professor of mine in college said, there's, there's no, there isn't just one way to do journalism. You know, there's, there's a lot of wrong ways, but there isn't just one right way. Um, so fortunately I had some, some great professors at San Jose state university and uh, started in news in Nevada. I was an anchor reporter for the NBC affiliate there. And just really kind of, uh, you know, um, formed and molded my way of telling stories, which, you know, in local news, you get the opportunity every now and then, but so much of it is, you know, the, the chemical spill at, you know, the, the gigafactory, go put together a 90 second story about that and flip it in one day. And then the next day you come back and it's a brand new story. And so as far as like long form journalism goes, uh, if I was able to get approval for a story that was three minutes long, I had to beg for about a week and I got, you know, two minutes and 45 seconds approved. So to pump out an hour and 15 minute podcast, I still laugh when I look at some of the links of them, like, my goodness, I never would have gotten this opportunity before. But yeah, it, it all started with with news um, and journalism and and being an anchor reporter in, in Nevada and uh, kind of building myself up from there. How'd you get from Nevada to Massachusetts? Yeah, so my contract in Nevada was up and my girlfriend is from the East Coast and she lived in Boston previously. And right as my contract was up in Nevada, she got a great offer in Boston. And so we just took off. And I had the idea for finding faces in news. You're going to laugh at this. I came back from Washington on an honor flight trip, honor flight, Nevada. Uh, for any of your listening. Yeah. I was in Washington, DC with honor flight, Nevada, covering it for news. Um, and for those listening who don't know about honor flight, they're a nonprofit organization that flies veterans, uh, to DC free of charge to see the sites and memorials built in their honor. And in Nevada, there's a branch and I would often go with them and, uh, kind of come back and do stories. Well, I met one of your colleagues while I was on one of those trips, Tim Tetz, and he just kind of casually told me about the wall of faces project. And I thought, okay there's something here. So I returned back to Nevada and pitched to my news director and my assistant news director, uh, uh, an idea of finding the last six pictures at the time that were still needed out of Nevada. There were only six guys who served in Nevada out of Vietnam who still needed a picture. And I pitched it to them and I said, Hey, I, I think this is a great, you know, little news series, six stories. It's perfect. That got, that got denied. And then it got denied again. And then it got denied again. So I always sat for whatever reason, they didn't want it. So I always sat on that. And then we moved to Massachusetts and I looked how many were missing out of mass. And I saw the number at the time was 30. And so that's when I just said, okay, this is, this is, this is our time to shine. This is the opportunity. And a podcast is perfect. The number 30 was, was like perfect. If we, if we go 50% success, then we have 15 episodes and, and we had 12, we got pretty close. 
Yeah, that's great. You're not the only one. You're not the obviously not the only one looking for for faces um, for those those thirty fallen fallen service members in in Massachusetts, right? Or or throughout the country. <laughs> Right. You know, you know more than I do. Um, I mean, if you were to compare the number of pictures I've found compared to some of the volunteers that you guys at VVMF have had all these years, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm on the bottom of the totem pole. Uh, there's, there's people from what I understand, and, and you can attest to this, I'm sure, who have found thousands of pictures on their own. Thousands of pictures. I'm not, I'm, I'm like, maybe I can count a couple dozen on myself. So, I mean, all credit to the people who have been doing this for, for 10 years or so. They're who I look up to. Um, but yeah, no, there's, there's certainly other people out there looking for pictures and, and I think it's great. I, I partnered with one of them, as you hear near the end of season one, we started working together and that was pretty fun. Um, but I, you know, I don't know how many people are actually kind of boots on the ground knocking on doors, uh, which is another reason why it was so important for us to make this because sometimes those best pictures you get are going to come from families who aren't willing to give them up easily. So building relationships and having them hand them over. And, and that's, what's been kind of special about finding faces is, is we end up with the best possible ones that we can get because they're the fa- in the family photo albums that are covered sometimes in an inch of dust in the basement and you got to brush them off and dig through. Yeah. So let's talk about your partner. How did, how did you get hooked up? With uh, Phil and Casey? Yeah. Yeah, Phil and Casey. I just knew I needed a veteran or someone with way more knowledge of the military and specifically the Vietnam War than than I have. I don't come from a rich military background. Uh, I mean, I sometimes or the majority of the time, at least before I started finding faces, these kind of military conversations would just go straight over my head. I wouldn't know what anyone's talking about. Just the jargon and the lingo, it's, it's confusing. And if you don't come from it, you don't know what the hell anyone's talking about a lot of the time. So I knew I needed someone who was going to just be there to either act as the translator or, or understand, or even if the families that we come across have questions that they've always looked for answers to, I may not be able to answer them, but a veteran might be able to be like, oh yeah, that sounds like they were, you know, in a, in an infantry or whatever. Um, so I, I called a veteran resource official there in every single county throughout Massachusetts. And I looked up the one in central Massachusetts and I just called the guy and I said, hey, I, I got this idea. This is what I'm doing. Is there is there anyone you think might work out, uh, might be able to help me I'm just looking for someone to tag along who can do this, that. And, and I figured I would, I would get, I figured I would get like six, seven names and I'd meet each of them. I'd call them and I, would you know, meet up with them and vet them and like try and figure out, you know, okay, who might be best for this? Who's comfortable with a microphone being slapped on their chest? Cause that's, you know, not everyone is comfortable with that. And this guy immediately just said, Oh, film a dial, film a dial. And I called him and halfway through my conversation with Phil, I, I just was like, I got to do anything I can to convince this guy to join me. And then he said, yeah. I'm not doing this without my buddy, Casey. <laughs> I said, you got it, whatever you want, whatever the hell you want, I'm in. Um, so that's how we got hooked up with them. And, and you, know, you listen to season one, they, they provide so, they're so valuable from a resource standpoint, but they provide so much comedic relief that is really necessary amid, amid some of these really difficult stories to listen to at times. Well, and some and so much color, right? And, I, and you know, it's not always bright. You know, um, one of the things that struck me about season one is I don't know how many of those doors would have stayed open for you. I mean, I think people open the door, they kind of check you out, right? But they don't invite you in until they see Phil and Casey standing there. You know right. what I mean? And right. they realize, oh, these are guys. Fr- they're from around here. These yeah. Are my, these are my and. People. And if my brother would have survived, this guy like represents like kind of what my brother would be now or what would he would look like now. And, sure. and I'm, I'm like, a I'm, I'm perceived think, in that moment as a jerk with a microphone. So it, it would have been impossible without them at times. Yeah, no kidding. But I think even had you shown up with a, you know, a retired Marine who served in Vietnam from te- but who was from Texas, I don't think it would have been the same. I think you had to get you had to get guys who were recognizable and familiar, you know, in some way. Right. To the people in that part of Massachusetts. And I'm talking about Worcester in particular. It's so true. It's so true. Yeah, you're so right. I mean, the accent, you know, I'm from here and they're always quick to, you know, where are you from? Oh, okay. I live on, you know, this street. 
uh, we're just a couple streets over. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. It's true. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a kid from Los Angeles who has no military background, <laughs> who's, who's put, who's pointing a microphone in, in the direction of your, of your mouth. Um, right. So right. you're right. You're right. And it's, asking it's me, and asking me hard, asking me hard questions, right? right? Questions that, you know, maybe I'm not super comfortable answering, you know, with a stranger, but those guys really man, talk about icebreakers. They're, they're incredible. Yeah. Yeah. They're special. And, uh, I, I figured it out right away. I, I just realized immediately, uh, you know, how, how could I have done this without them? But what's funny about this is you're saying this is it's all true. Absolutely. But then I started to have to give them a crash course in journalism where, because they started to get uncomfortable in the beginning when people started to get emotional and, and that would make Phil and Casey feel uncomfortable. And so they would want to immediately divert the conversation to something else because they're uncomfortable and they're worried about this person. And, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm behind them waving my arms going, shut up. And, and I don't want that to be confused because I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm, my whole goal is to get people to cry on me and capitalize. Um, but this is a journalistic you know, endeavor as much as it is finding the pictures. It's finding the pictures first and foremost. If you do not want to talk to me, but you want to give me a picture, but you want me to, you know, you know, basically screw off after that, that's fine. I'm out. I'm here for the picture. Anything after that, if you invite me, if you invite us into your house and, and you want to talk, then, then great. Um, this will now add to the storytelling aspect of this. And if a person is breaking down, um, they more times than not, they've needed this. They, they need to talk about this. They've kept it suppressed for too long. And so at first, you know, Phil and Casey would just not even let them get there. And I'm like, no, no, no. So you guys, if someone wants to talk, you let them talk. You just let them talk because we're going to be able to help them first and foremost. Uh, and, and that's what we're here for. So that was, yeah, they, they were 90% perfect in the beginning. And I eventually got them to 100 and, and they, they understood and figured it out. Yeah. Well, you got 12 episodes in season one, right? And I'm, I think I've gotten through five of them so far. Um, you know, without any spoilers, you know, do you want to talk about just take kind of zoom out and talk about the overall arc of season one? And, sure. Uh, in terms of what, particularly the things that we need to know about it as we head into season two. Sure. So at the time, I think there were around 200 pictures that were still missing from the wall of faces or, or rather 200 uh, servicemen who did not have pictures up on the wall of faces. And uh, it was pretty easy then to be able to pull up a, a state that either you were in or a state that was close by to you. And there were a couple who needed pictures still. Now it's like, I mean, what you guys need pictures out of like New York city and Puerto Rico. Like that's it. There's like one in Georgia and like one in Los Angeles or something like that. So you can't do that anymore. But at the time we pulled up new England and there were 30 missing. They all happen to be out of Massachusetts. So yeah, season one is, is our quest to find pictures of those 30 guys. And like I said, it resulted in about 10 or 11 of them. Uh, we have 12 episodes because one episode we turned out to replace a pretty poor picture of a guy by finding, uh, trying to find his family. But yeah, well, so it's- important. That's an important part of the effort, right? It's not just, I mean, I think initially it was, can we get a picture of, of everybody? And now I think the next, the next phase for Wall of Faces is, can we get a better picture for some of these guys? And as you make that transition, so does Finding Faces, because now we're, we're in a place, um, season two is gonna be based in San Diego, and we're in a place where there are no more missing pictures left. So it's all about replacing poor quality ones. Um, but yeah, season one, we were able to basically find new pictures uh, or pictures for guys who had no pictures at all. And, you know, the, it's, it's funny, the, the root of each story is always, we're looking for a picture of this guy. But after that, the direction each episode goes or can go is, we have no idea. We go knocking on a door, having absolutely no idea what we're about to walk into. And, and everyone always asks, understandably so, you know, what do you, what do you want to know? Like, what are you, what are you trying to find out? And I'm just like, there's really nothing specific that we're trying to find out. We just want to collect a photo. And if there's anything you want to tell us, and that's the story, it's whatever comes of the conversation. So, it, you know, it could be a uh, episode, I believe 10 in season one, whatever episode Connie is uh, a guy 
he lost two brothers in Vietnam and he's always wondered how they both died. Never, never found out, never was given a specific answer or a specific reason. And 50 years later, we said, oh, wow, um, we'll, we'll try and help you. And we dug through military records and were able to give him answers, uh, things like that. So you, you never know what the story is going to be, but it all starts with needing to find a picture for the wall of faces. I think one of the biggest surprises for me as I've gotten to know this community a little bit and this effort a little bit is how often I, I talk to people who for 25 years or 30 years had no details. They had no idea what happened. I don't know why it was so difficult for people to get that information. But to me, that was the biggest surprise, which, it, you know, the biggest surprise for me was, and, and there was, I think it was in the episode, uh, the episode about the, the guy from Hawaii. He wasn't from Hawaii, but mm. he was living in Hawaii. Which was Joseph Dignall. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think, was it his sister? And she was talking about how she, she never, she didn't like you, you, for example, you brought her uh, a printout of all the decorations that he had earned. Yeah. Well, she had no idea that he'd been so highly decorated. She had no clue. How do these families not know? So to me, that was the biggest surprise was realizing that, that many of these families have very, very little information. What was the biggest surprise for you? That's definitely up there. Um, yeah, just, just the lack of understanding and there's a technological difference, um, for some of these people, you know, I mean, it's, it's an older generation, so it may be, it may be kind of easy for, for me to look it up, or at least I, I know how to start to try and acquire this information, but think about 50 years ago, it's the same reason why these pictures can be so hard to find. People didn't walk around with, you know, cell phones with cameras attached to them back then. Um, so it's kind of the same concept. Yeah, it's definitely lack of information, or at least people who, whose parents didn't talk about it. Uh, and I can't, you know, relate to losing a, a brother in war and how my parents would react. I'm, I'm, it's completely understandable. But then that that leaves the next generation wanting to know. And a lot of these parents kind of took that information to their grave. And again, I wouldn't fault anyone for doing that. But now all this time later, some of these siblings are maybe they're now retired. They just have a lot more time to think about stuff. And they're going, my God, why wasn't I ever told the answers? And if my family was told an answer, why didn't my parents want to tell me? Yeah, that, that's, that's really surprising. Um, it's also surprising how often either we walk into someone's house and they have like a complete shrine on their wall of framed photos of their brother who died 50 years ago and his medals and, you know, a framed etching from the wall in Washington, D.C. or whatever it is. And then at the same time, how often we need to be there for 45 minutes while someone digs through their basement trying to just find one picture. And again, I, it, I'm not going to fault anyone for either situation. It could be too difficult for people to hang a picture of their brother on the wall, but they do have one. And when we come around, this is their opportunity to, to finally, you know, get that picture where it needs to be. And it usually always works out just fine. Hmm. That's actually a perfect kind of segue into uh, teeing up this mini episode that we're going to hear in just a minute. Um, because this particular episode is you responding to a request from someone else. So can you, can you set that up a little bit? How yeah, sure. Up? So, so the, you, first of all, first of all, do you get a lot of requests from people? Are people starting to, cause you said, you know, it might be easier for me to look it up. Right. Cause I'm right. technologically, I'm, a, I'm a, what do you, the, the digital, digital native, right? Right. <laughs> um, so is it, is it common for people to ask you to do that kind of digging for them and uh, and then you know why this one yeah it's been happening more and more um so what what your listeners are about to hear is a woman who simply just contacted me on facebook and said hey my fiance died in vietnam about 50 years ago and i've been wanting a picture of him ever since i don't have a picture of him and fortunately on the wall of faces a picture of james nelson humans is his name from savannah georgia um, existed and, and is a good one. So I was able to send it to her, but we've also had people contact us saying, Hey, here's a picture of me and this guy in Vietnam. When we served together, we were so close. 
and after we left Vietnam, we haven't spoken since. And and I just would love nothing more than to find him and, and reconnect with him. Uh, we, I've taken those those phone calls before. Uh, we've got another gentleman right now whose father died when he was six months old in Vietnam. And his mother kind of, uh, they left his side of the family. She remarried to a man who, who adopted him and raised him as his own great relationship. But all these years later, he's always wanted to meet or just get to know or find out if anyone from his biological father's side of the family is still out there. He's never had a conversation with any of them. And, and they've reached out to, to us asking for, for help finding them. So if anyone's listening, who has uh, questions or if there's anything we might be able to help you with, you know, that that's also what we're doing with finding faces. So the, the main seasons, you listen to season one and then season two based in San Diego, what we're working on now, um, those are going to be us knocking on doors and acquiring photos. But these mini episodes that we're starting to put out there, like the one we're about to play are kind of the reverse <laughs> people going, Hey, I'm looking for a picture. Do you have one? Yeah, I got one right here, which is kind of funny. Um, I, I did not envision us helping loved ones find photos when we started our venture to find photos from loved ones, but that's what's worked out. Yeah, I guess I'm a little surprised that um, this woman was able to find you on Facebook, right? So she's aware of you, which means she's aware of your podcast, which means she's aware of the wall of faces, but she didn't go to the wall of faces to get the picture. Right. She went to you to get the picture. I didn't ask questions. I, yeah. I was curious too. <laughs> yeah. well, I think it's but, great. And it's, a, you know, it was, uh, it was, however very, we can help. it was very moving. I thought, um, you know, after, sorry, I can't believe I forgot to silence my phone. <laughs> what a rookie, what a rookie mistake. Beauty of podcasting. It's not live. You're good. Yeah. Um, there we go. Um, where was I? I was talking about the lady in uh, the McDonald's drive through Oh, I know what I was going to say is that, you know, after listening to several episodes of season one, um, I went into the mini episode a little skeptical, right? Because I found season one so compelling, right? I mean, it really does have a nice arc, a nice through line that, that, that gives it, what's the word? Momentum, I think. Mm. And so... I listened to this mini episode a little bit feeling like, okay, now, now I have to go take this detour, right? I have to get off of my, I have to break my momentum to go hear about this kind of aside. Mm -hmm. uh, and I loved it. And I was, you know, I didn't expect to, I didn't expect to enjoy it as much as I did. So I hope you do more of those. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's the same situation where we go knocking on the door and we ask for a picture. And if someone says, I'll give you a picture, but I don't want to participate at all in what you're doing that's totally fine. We'll take the picture and we'll get out of here. Same thing with these mini episodes. People contact us asking for help with, you know, all the different things I just described. And as a side note, Hey, we're creating these mini episodes. Do you mind if I hit record and put an episode out there? And then if they say yes, then great. If they say no, we're, we're of course still going to help them. Um, so it's all just dependent on how, how willing people are. And fortunately, um, Claudine, uh, James Nelson Newman's fiance from 50 years ago was was more than willing and uh, comfortable talking to us as you'll as you'll hear the uh, various parts of the of the conversation. McDonald's drive through is the uh, is the preview tease to keep you listening. Yeah, great, great. Um, so I think maybe what we'll do, Ryan, is after we play the episode, we'll come back and maybe put a little tag on this thing. Cool. Uh, Sounds good. And one thing I'd like to hear about, we, you mentioned it earlier, and I don't think we had a chance to talk about it, was the the episodes you produced as you were driving from Boston to San Diego with your moving van full of stuff and a couple of cats in tow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, did you want to do that right now? Yeah, yeah, we could do it now. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not actually going to play the episode right now. No, I know. <laughs> You don't want to listen to it for 20 minutes? Um, yeah, so, okay. Um, uh, we, yeah, I had, a, I had a glitch, so you just kind of it froze for a second. But you're uh, back okay. now. It's okay, all good. Cool. But, yeah, if you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the road trip and uh, how you managed to, to move and produce podcast episodes at the same time. Managed is a loose term. That. 
it's a loose term that you just used <laughs> manage to successfully make it work. No, it's not the first time that I've, I've included knocking on doors in the middle of something else that I've done. I can't remember if it was an anniversary or a, or a uh, birthday trip with my girlfriend in uh, New England. We were either in New Hampshire or Vermont and the weekend was over. So the celebration was done. And, and on our way back to Boston, I, we went knocking on a door because <laughs> there was a brother who lived in like New England or Vermont or wherever we were. And so, yeah, no, we just moved from Boston to San Diego and with the U-Haul trailer attached to the back of my truck, two cats created in the back seat. Uh, I had about three different names each day, the five days of the drive. That was my goal was to knock on three different doors and a bunch of research beforehand to try and find siblings. And uh, there was some success and there were some epic failures. So we're going to kind of wrap those together for, uh, for season two and, and we'll, we'll start off season two with the drive. So uh, there will be plenty of cat meows and cries that you'll that you'll hear leading into San Diego. But you know, I I, I could not do it. I'm driving across the country, and and I have all these opportunities to maybe knock on some doors of of pictures that may not be able to see the light of day without doing so. So it was it was important to me to be able to do that. So I'm assuming that you did some some routing to make that possible, right? You didn't just get on 90 and drive right. across straight. Like you must have. Yeah, I mean, we, but, you, but you still made the trip in five days. So it couldn't have been, you couldn't have been doing that much routing. Right. So basically the way I did it was I typed in the directions to San Diego. There were three options. I went the most Southern route simply to avoid weather because that, that took me through Texas. And ironically, a week after I got through Texas, it was the craziest weather that the country's basically seen all year long. And I chose that route to avoid it. So thankfully I avoided that. But anyways, I typed in the route and then I looked at all of the major towns that I'd be going through in the middle of each day's drive um, with, you know, each day averaging like, like nine hours of driving, 10 hours of driving. And I looked, okay, so day one was after three hours, I'm going to be in Harrisburg, PA. Okay. Let's look up the pictures that need to be replaced out of Harrisburg, PA. Oh, there's three of them. Okay. Now let's research those three guys and find their siblings. Okay. I think I found the address for this guy's brother and just go knocking on those doors. So we, we started off with huge success. Like day one was like, if, if all five days replicate this, we're not even going to have a season two in San Diego. Season three will be San Diego. Season two will be road trip. And then it kind of all went downhill from there. <laughs> I did not replicate the success of day one, like I, like uh, the rest of the days. So, uh, but it was, it was fun. It was also a nice way to break up. If you're driving across country, it's a, it's a good way to break up the trip. You know, you, you're only yeah, four hours away from where you're going as opposed to 10 hours. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing, <laughs> nothing nerve wracking about knocking on someone's, you know, door with wondering if the cats are going to be okay for an hour without you. There's, there's nothing negative about that. <laughs> no, not at all. And then, you know, the whole just doing that in the middle of a pandemic is amazing, you know? Right, right. It, uh, it helps, you know, depending on what state you're in, there's looser regulations. But like I said, at the beginning of, you know, of this discussion, that's the problem we're, we're having with season two is, was when can we really get started to the point where people welcome you into their home? Because the kinds of conversations that the majority of these episodes become or result from, they're not happening on the front doorstep. You know, they're happening after an, an hour of being inside someone's home and them getting to know you and getting comfortable with you. So it was a, it was a challenge. So uh, success or not, I don't know, but we, we gave it a shot and you'll hear about it. Perfect. I'm just gonna let that hang for a second because that's a we'll probably that's probably the note we'll end on.